Amen, let's go. Hey, welcome friends in the room. Check, check, check. Welcome friends in Fort Worth. El Paso, Houston, Porch, North Dallas is kicking off tonight in Frisco and Plano at the Angelica Theater. So welcome to you guys and everybody else tuning in from around the country. I was flying back from Atlanta yesterday and got food poisoning, which was awesome. So today and the last 24 hours have been interesting. So uh, if tonight seems interesting, there you go. And uh, hey, we're continuing this series, Instagram Theology, where we are looking at some of the cultural mantras and questioning how they align with biblical truth. And um, one of the things that I love about social media is oftentimes it gives a voice or it gives a perspective or it just showcases just different things in culture that create a uh, unique rise among people. What do I mean by that? Recently, if you've been following on Twitter or you've been following on Instagram, mainly Twitter, there has been a debate taking place or a war, some have called it, about the chicken sandwich. What is the best chicken sandwich? Is it Chick-fil-A? Is it Popeye's? Who has had a Popeye's chicken sandwich in here? They're sold out, dude. The most genius marketing ploy of all time, but they're sold out. But there's just been a back and forth that a lot of hilarious things have come out of that and different memes and different people raising their voice and raising the perspective on like, hey, this is the best chicken sandwich of all time. And it's just kind of like exploded and people putting forward, you know, Chick-fil-A versus Popeye's and then Wendy's tries to throw something in there just to get a little, get a little air time. And everyone's like, all right, we're done with you. And back to Chick-fil-A and Popeye's and just people going off about, you know, hey, this is what I think is best. No, this is what is best. No, this is what's best. Hey, you haven't even tried it yet. You don't have the uh, chance or you don't have the right to even speak into this. This is for sure the best chicken sandwich that is out there. Or really, you know, if you take the Popeyes and you add the Chick-fil-A sauce, that's the best scenario that you can have, really. And people just going off about, you know, their opinion and expressing it. And social media gives us really a chance to kind of voice what we think uh, is true or our opinion about a certain situation. And this was another recent scenario in the last couple of weeks where that happened with the sandwich. Not dissimilar to a time about a year ago where there was another moment in our culture or on social media where another thing came up that sharply divided people around what is actually true and what is, uh, their perspective on this thing was. What I mean, it was something that had to do with an audio tape or audio recording. <laughs> oh man, you guys know it. And this is the audio recording. I think, Billy, you have it. Laurel, 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 And in the room right now, you are Laurel. either hearing Laurel, Laurel. or Yanny. Laurel. By show of hands, all right, that's, that's enough. It's a little creepy, more creepy than I thought it would be. By show of hands, who hears Laurel in this room? Oh, wow. Okay, by, uh, uh, who hears Yanny? Wow, wait a second, one more time. Hold on, hold on. Laurel, raise, raise them high, raise them praise. Okay, I hear, I hear Laurel. Who hears Yanny? Okay, the math doesn't add up. Some of you guys are raising your hands twice here. It was another one of those moments where in culture, everyone was like, hey, you guys are crazy to think that it's Yanny or you're crazy to think that it's Laurel. I'm not even gonna bring up the black and blue dress gate of 2015, we're over that one. But social media has really given us, you know, a chance to kind of divide and take sides and express our opinion and express what we think it is and express our perspective on the matter or our opinion on it. And the reason I start there is because tonight we're going to talk about another subject or really something that goes along those lines that is a cultural mantra that takes place often in social media, but really even more broadly in society that further encourages you have an opinion and you have a perspective and you need to share that perspective, but it doesn't call it your perspective, it calls it share your truth. There's a cultural mantra that you and I should be encouraged to go speak your truth. That you have a truth, you have a story, you need to speak it. It was popularized by Oprah in 2013 at an award ceremony where she just said that the most important thing or the most powerful thing that you can do is to speak your truth. Other variations of it can look like people saying things like, man, I've just been trying to live my truth lately. Or saying, in the midst of a conversation where maybe you disagree with somebody, they're like, hey, dude, that, that, that works for you. We disagree. Your truth is your truth. My truth is mine. It's really another variation of the you do you or do whatever makes you happy. No longer is there just kind of a source or singular, singular truth, but what is true could be just true for you. 
Now, the consequences of the scenario with Laurel and Yanny, the chicken sandwich is really just kind of a matter of opinion, but when it comes to the Laurel and Yanny, it's a matter of like your perspective. And there are times where like my perspective, I could believe it's true, but it's not necessarily the truth. There is a truth to whether it's Laurel or Yanny. But the consequences of, of believing wrongly or having the wrong perspective or believing the wrong truth about that thing are, are pretty minimal, other than it may you know, in, make for interesting conversation with your coworkers or with friends after tonight. But the consequences for believing a perspective that's not true about marriage, about God, about you, about the type of job you should work, about the type of relationships you should have, about what life is about are much more significant. And we as a society have never been in more need of truth. Not a generic, high level, kind of like speak your truth in this moving target and you know what's true for me may not be true for you, but an actual truth. And every way that you look, our society seems to be kind of embracing this idea that you know, whatever you feel like, that is your truth. And whenever a person a people, a country, or society begins to believe that idea. There are significant consequences. And the Bible, here's what's crazy. God speaks to this exact idea about why, hey, speak your truth. As subtle as it be, because I think most of us just mean like, mm, yes, Popeye's chicken sandwich, mm, girl, speak your truth. We mean it in a subtle way. But it can be even a dangerous thing if we begin to think that truth is kind of a moving target and it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's kind of just... Whatever you deem as truth, they should just say, man, mm, speak your opinion. And so we're going to look tonight at some of the ideas and how you and I can begin to recognize, hey, what am I believing right now that may not be true? What is my perspective? And I truly feel it in this moment. But how can I know when something is actually true? And what should I do with my perspective when it doesn't align with reality or the truth? And how do I even determine kind of what's reality if I really do feel in this moment? I'm here in Yanny and it's Laurel. I'm here in Laurel and it's actually Yanny. And so we're going to look at just this idea and dive into what God's word has to say about truth. Because here's the deal. At the moment that society began to put forward something that says truth, it's like they stepped and we all stepped into God's playpen. Because God says truth is not something you define, I define it. And so we're going to look at what the Bible says about this idea of truth and significant consequences for any people who do not embrace the reality of truth. So three ideas, three ways that you can recognize. Here's the danger with all these different social media um, mantras is there some partial truth to each of them. There's like some partial truth to speak your truth. It's it, another way of saying it is there is some partial truth to the idea of, hey, you should share your perspective, your opinion at times, your story. The danger in all the different things we're gonna look at for the next few weeks is that they're, they're not these huge, big, distorted lies. It's like they're just, they take a truth and then they just twist it a little bit. In other words, what makes a counterfeit more easily able to deceive someone is how closely it resembles the thing it's trying to fake or be a counterfeit of. Like in other words, I don't know if you guys uh, uh, have seen fake Louis Vuitton purses if they like go to New York on that one street, whatever street that is called, and you're able to like buy uh, a version of Louis Vuitton purses. Like here's, here's two real ones and a fake one right next to each other. Just imagine with me, if you will, two real ones <laughs> and a fake one right next to each other no, they don't have them? Okay, we're just gonna keep imagining that they're there. <laughs> and if you look at it, uh, what I was gonna pull up is two pictures, or one that maybe they'll pull up here in a second, of just like, here's these two Louis Vuitton purses, and they're strikingly similar. And if you're a girl, you may be able to like notice you know, all the different intricacies if you looked really hard, but as a guy, I'm like, I don't know. And then there was also one of a regular purse that someone had just taken a Sharpie and written Louis Vuitton on the outside. And I'm not the smartest guy, but even I can go, I don't know that that was like what Louis was going for, or that is an actual <laughs> Louis Vuitton. And so what makes a counterfeit dangerous is just it's, a, it's closer to the truth and then subtly twisted. So we're going to look at another one of these truths or semi-truths that's just taken truth and twisted it and look at three ways that you and I can recognize, begin to recognize, hey, where am I believing a lie? Where's my perspective off? And what is actually the truth and how can I live by it? So the first idea, the first thing to recognize is recognize that your perspective may or may not be true. The problem with speak your truth is it suggests that your perspective or what you feel is always the truth. Now you may truly feel something, but that doesn't mean that it's true. 
In other words, your perspective at times, it may be true or it may not be true, but knowing, hey, in every situation, I need to come at this humbly knowing that my perspective on what's going on here, on what my coworkers think about me, on what the person I'm dating thinks about me or how this is going, about why they didn't invite me to hang out with those people, it may be truth or it may not be true. And so approaching it with a cautiousness, recognizing that your perspective or your feelings are not always an accurate indicator of reality. I wrote in my notes that what you feel is not always real. It may be really what you feel, and you should be honest about that, and you shouldn't hide it and pretend like you're not feeling that, but you should also recognize that what you feel may not be an accurate depictor of reality. Your perspective is not always an accurate one. It's very simple on the head, but it has significant consequences, and it completely contradicts the idea of speaking your truth. It's not dissimilar to really like Instagram in general, as we've talked about in this whole series. Uh, Instagram is kind of a perfect example of where my perspective is definitely not reality. And the more that I get on Instagram and I look at people's Insta stories or I look at their account and the things that they're posting, and I believe that that's actually real life, the more I'm going to have a distorted view of kind of everyone else's life but my own. You think about this? Like when I get on Instagram, all the pictures that people post, and you do it too, and I do it too, where they're like pictures of people and they're riding around bikes with baskets on the front that are from the 70s and they're getting cupcakes together. They're always on vacation, always swimming in the pool, somewhere warmer. Their life is together. It's like, do these people even work? No, they don't have to work. They got money growing on trees in their backyard. That's what they do. They drive in the right car. They have the best clothes. They look amazing. And here's the kicker. They're always smiling. And then you get to be around them. And here's the weird thing about ministry. It's like you, you kind of rub elbows with a bunch of different people at different times. And you get to know them. And it's like their life is falling apart. Their marriage is falling apart. They're struggling with depression and antidepressants. They're, they're like in this place where it's so, so much pain. And yet if you just went off of what you saw you would have to come to the conclusion your perspective is not reality. Instagram is not real. And in the same way, your perspective is not always real. The things that you're feeling are not always an accurate depiction. The biggest problem with speak your truth is it suggests truth could be different from person to person, which by definition contradicts what truth is. What do I mean by that? Like the definition of truth. Like here's the definition from dictionary.com. I think they have this slide. If not, I'm going to be flying blind here. Boom, they've got it. Okay, no Louis Vuitton, but we do have dictionary.com. All the different definitions of, of truth, if you were to type it in. So, hey, to have the true or actual state of matter, conformity with fact or reality, a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, principle. I'm not even going to read all of them, but here's what you'll notice all of them have in common. None of them suggest that truth is something that you can change or that you can tweak and that you can make kind of whatever best suits you and you do you or whatever best suits your scenario and your situation right there. Like truth is fixed. And by definition, the reason speak your truth falls apart is you cannot have a truth that is just unique to you and not universally true. Because truth by definition is something that is in line with reality. But we, on an individual level, all the time, try to escape and try to live as though there isn't like fixed truth and I can kind of live how whatever's true for me, both as an individual, we do this, and really as a like society, we are so confused. Uh, as an individual, what do I mean? I mean, I mean, people who are like, hey, you know what? I know, you know, the Bible doesn't exactly encourage living together, but me and my girl, we're moving in. It's cheaper rent. I just think it's the best move for us. We need to get to know each other before we move further in this relationship, find out if we're compatible. So we're going to move in together, begin to spend time forming that relationship before we get too serious. That's what I think is best for us. That's kind of like the truth that I think we should follow and live by. That's an example of somebody living their truth or living according to their perspective and their feelings. Another example would be couples who are like, you know, uh, sex before marriage, I guess the Bible is not real big on that, but I think that if we're gonna get married, we need to find out if we're sexually compatible, or we're married in God's eyes, and we're gonna get married eventually, so we should, you know, move towards that direction. People, you know, culture says, wait till you're ready, and I feel like I was born ready, so let's do this. <laughs> and that's somebody speaking their truth. Another example would be, and this is a really common one young, um, among young adults, uh, and that was the uh, idea that 
hey, I know I'm supposed to get plugged into a church, but you know, all, every church is messed up, and me and Jesus are cool, and you can't tell me that I can't be cool with Jesus if I'm not a member of a church somewhere, and so I'm gonna do me, that's what I think is best for me in this situation. And you're living your truth. You wouldn't say it that way, but that's exactly what you're doing. You're doing what seems right to you in that scenario. Tragically, as a society, in a way that is shocking, we're doing this like more than ever, where we have begun to embrace and go full tilt, do whatever you feel. Whatever you feel is right, that's what you should do. There isn't really a right and wrong, like whatever you feel is your reality and is your truth. What do I mean? Think about things like gender. In looking this week at Facebook, do you know how many genders you can suggest and select on Facebook? 58. I think they have a list of these. There they are. Two for, two for three, guys. Here we go. 58 different genders. A gender. <laughs> We're going to go through each one of these. and Because uh, they're just saying, hey, gender is kind of a moving target. We don't want anyone to feel left out. And so just in case we missed you, we're going to put other at the very last. <laughs> Sometimes I think about trying to explain to someone like 10 years ago this and how confused they would be. And sometimes I think in 100 years, they're going to be so confused on what was wrong with these people. But as a society, we are thinking, and I'm not pointing that out to be judgmental or do anything or condemning, because the Bible would say there are only two genders. My point in pointing all of that out is as a society, you cannot argue with the fact that we have wholesale bought the idea of, hey, you do you, whatever you define as your truth, that's your truth. We've done the same thing as it relates to when life begins. There's so many examples, but here's another one, is the idea that when life begins, is really up to you. That a child is not a child unless the mother feels like it is a child. Last year, the House of Representatives in the United States Congress passed a bill that a child in the womb is not a child until the point of birth. Our, a girl on our team is 34 weeks pregnant. Look up a 34 week old ultrasound. It's shocking. All of his organs are developed. Every eyelid is there. His fingerprints are his own. Everything. And that happens much earlier in the scenario. But our culture has said that unless the wife, or the wife, unless the mother feels like it is a baby, it is not a baby. And she can make the decision to end the life inside of her at any point because we as a culture have said that feelings trump all. We have, instead of making our lives pursue the heart of God, we have made the heart a God. And it is going to have, it's already having tremendous consequences. And the God who's there is saying, I do not want you to live with the perspective that everything you feel is reality. And if you follow your heart, it's going to lead you to bad and deadly places, both for a culture, a country who does that, and for an individual who allows that to happen inside of their own life. Proverbs chapter 14 says, and speaks to this exact idea, that there is a way Verse 12 of Proverbs chapter 14, there's a way that seems to appear to be right, but in the end leads to death. How brilliant was Solomon? Like this, this verse right here, if you guys haven't been in church for a while, or maybe this is your first time back in a while, either way, this is probably some of the oldest literature you've ever written or ever read before. In other words, if you read like Homer or Plato or any of that stuff, this far is older than that, hundreds of years older than that. And even hundreds of years ago, Solomon sitting down, one of the wisest people who ever lived, or wisest person other than Jesus who ever lived, wrote that there is a way, as he observed society, that people think like, oh yeah, this is a good idea. Oh yeah, we should do this. Yeah, this is a great idea. And it leads to death and destruction inside of their life. We see this in so many different arenas, so many different relationships where people are like, yeah, I know he's not exactly a Christian, but I love him. And I just feel like I could be a good influence on his life. And it leads to heartbreak. People take substances and get addicted and are trapped inside of just a bondage to a substance and they do so by their own choosing. Think about that, just like the self-destructiveness. There's something in all of us that's broken. And Solomon says, if you begin to follow your heart, it's gonna take you in a direction that always ends in pain for you and pain for anyone who's a part of that. The reason why is because the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine, the reason why there's something inside of it that seems like, yes, this is right, and you're walking off a cliff is because you have a heart 
that is utterly sick. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above everything else or above all things and beyond cure. Think about that. The Bible says that your heart, like, have you met somebody who's like really good at lying? And then we've all met people who are like really bad at lying. We're like, yeah, I, I, I know you're not telling the truth, so I can tell it's written all over your face. The Bible says that the heart, it's like world class at lying to you. It'll deceive you. You won't even realize that you're being deceived in a moment. Because the heart, this thing inside of you, has been fractured by sin, and it's utterly sick. It says, beyond cure, who can understand it? The danger of when you make the heart your God, or what you feel be the determining factor about what you do, is that you and I have sick hearts. And God has invited us to surrender our life, to surrender to his spirit, and allow him to walk with us to begin to restore and direct our life. But if you just allow your heart to be the direction of your life, you are not gonna head in a direction that you want to end up. So the first idea is that we're told that if you follow what your perspective, what you think is real, it will always end up costing you, that your feelings are real, they're not always reliable, and they're not always determining of what is real. Uh, not long ago, I got to, I guess it was a while ago now, but once upon a time, I got to go in a um, private jet with a friend of mine. And um, anyone ever been on a private jet before? Yeah, this is like not a circle that I'd run in very often. So I was like, dude, this is amazing. And, uh, and so I got to go sit on this private jet. He was flying to St. Louis for something related to work. And, and he was like, yeah, you wanna come with me? And got in there and it was all amazing. And leather chairs, you're like, this is incredible. And I start talking to the pilot because um, I'm just fascinated by the whole situation. And the pilot, I'm asking about flying and you know, how fast does this thing go and yada, yada, yada. At some point he's like, you wanna come up here? And I'm like, I thought you'd never ask. Okay, so I get in the cockpit and he lets me sit in the cockpit as we're like taking off and flying. And what happened when we took off and got into the air was so shocking to me and terrifying, honestly, because we got into the clouds and we couldn't see anything. I don't know what I was expecting, but I guess I was thinking like, man, you're going to go up into the air and you can like see the horizon. This is beautiful. Oh, hey, guys. And I'd be able to see kind of things that are out there. You couldn't see anything. It was like somebody just put a giant fog machine in front of the plane and was just blowing smoke. You just see the clouds in front of you. And as we began to talk... It was like, how do you know where you're going? How do you make sure that you're not like flying into another plane that's coming here? It was kind of terrifying. And he said, this is honestly what it's like all the time. The way that you know is you trust the instruments. You can't go on based on what you see or even what you feel because it'll lead you astray. Like, do you know this is a crazy thing? Did you know that there's something called black hole vertigo? And it basically is a scenario, and this happens if you ever meet a pilot or you know someone who's a pilot, you could ask them about it, where basically you will feel like you are traveling in one direction because all of your senses, when they get up in the air, vertigo clicks in, black hole vertigo, and it begins to trick you and it makes you think that you're headed in a direction you're not really headed in. This is how JFK Jr., if you remember JFK Jr., that's how he died, is he thought he was flying straight and he ended up flying right into the ocean. That it'll trick your senses to being like, oh yeah, we're fine, and you're upside down that you can't tell, you're totally disoriented, it messes with your senses. So if you go based on what you feel, you will destruct. Or you're putting your life in incredible risk and incredible chaos is likely to happen. Or you go based on what the instruments and the levels and all the different machines that are part of a, a jet plane tell you to do. They tell you, even when I feel like, oh man, we're headed upside down, they, they'll tell you when it's level. Even when I feel like, man, we're not headed the right direction, it tells you exactly the direction that you're going in, that you have to trust not what you feel, but the instruments. As a Christian, the Bible tells us that we are to take all of the things that we feel and try to align them with God's word. Don't trust the things that you feel if they don't align with God's word. Don't trust them if they don't align with the instrument that is the Bible. Which brings us to the second idea, the second thing to recognize as it relates to this idea of truth, which is that God's word is truth. Recognize that God's word, that means the Bible, is truth. Anytime my feelings, my perspective, my opinion doesn't align with God's word or contradicts God's word, I either submit to his word and to his authority or to my own opinion and make myself really the source of truth of what I think is right and wrong. And in doing so, I forfeit what God said is the blessing of the life that he wants to lead me to. In Proverbs chapter three, verse three through five, it says this, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not trust your heart as Lord. Trust the Lord with your heart, with everything that you feel. That's what that means. And do not lean on your own understanding, on what you think is right. 
on how you think you should date, how you think you should handle money, when do you think you should leave a job? On how you should talk about people. Whatever seems right to you, he says, I wouldn't lean on that. Lean and trust in the Lord and trust in his word with all of your heart and all of your understanding. Submit those to God. In all of your ways, submit to him and he will make straight your paths. He'll lead you to a life that doesn't look dysfunctional and broken and so messed up, but is a life that's full of healthy relationships, full of a relationship that is connected to your creator, a life full of purpose and freedom. That's what that means. That you and I are to recognize God's word is truth. That I am told that I am to trust the truth of God's revelation in every single situation. I trust the truth of God's revelation. That's what the Bible is. In every single situation. Whatever is going on in my life, that I'm to go, man, what would God's word say about this situation right now? If I'm insecure about what my boss thinks about me, what would God's word say about that? Well, it would say that, man, the heart of kings or those in leadership and the things that they think, it's like water in the hands of the Lord. He turns them wherever he wants. God, you're in control over what the people above me and my workplace, what they think about me, what their opinions are of me. The best thing I can do is surrender and to trust in you. I'm not gonna be anxious and insecure and worried about that. My singleness, my concern over whether or not I'm gonna get married, God, I'm gonna look to you and I'm gonna surrender and trust in you. You have a plan for my life. If you want me to be married, I don't need to try to maneuver and try to manipulate and get on 75 dating apps and make it all work for myself. I can trust you. That in your timing, I'm just gonna continue to say, what does God's word say? And I'm gonna look for the type of person in God's word that you tell me I should date, I should be in relationship with, that I can trust you. I'm gonna recognize that your word is truth in my life. Jesus, in one of his final prayers for his boys, the disciples, in John chapter 17, was praying to his heavenly father for his 12 men. And he said this, Father, would you make them holy by your truth? Teach them your word, which is truth. God's word is the truth, and living by it leads to life. Following Jesus and living according to God's word will make you better at life and will make your life better. It's not gonna enrich, like we talked about last week, it's not, this isn't the prosperity gospel, but it promises that, hey, when you begin to date, think, live, operate, follow the instructions in God's word, it will make your life better and it will make you better at life. And he has called us to not just have this thing that we read every now and then or read even in the mornings, but to read and to begin to apply it to our life, to take what is the principles that God left here for me to apply to my life. I think the problem is when we read the Bible, it's honestly so confusing. I mean, can you get an amen? There's times you pick it up and you're like, what is he saying right here? I know that these prophets are cuckoo for go-go buffs and I don't know what they're saying. And a lot of that is because of the context that you're not reading it with, that you're not understanding exactly what's going on. That the goal, if you're gonna be a student of God's word, because in order to apply God's word, you gotta know God's word. And the challenge when a lot of us go to know or to read God's word, it's like, man, this thing is so confusing. And people will say things like, you know, the Bible, it's the roadmap to life. And then you're like, all right, well, I gotta pull this thing out and I'm looking for directions on should I marry her or not. And uh, okay, here is Callie, the one for me. Huh, men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you gave gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come from every side with your whorings. What in the world? God, are you trying to tell me something right now? Is this an alarm bell that you're letting me know? We just kind of flip open like it's a magic eight ball. Or we're going to work and we're like, man, does God want me to stay in this job or does he not? I don't, I don't really know what we have me do. Okay, let's just flip. Okay, this is a good one. All right, 44-2, uh, okay. And the Lord said to me, this gate shall remain shut. It shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. The Lord your God of Israel has entered by it. I'm so confused right now. All right, I'll try again tomorrow. And that's what we do. We look at it like a magic eight ball, where we're like, I'm just gonna kind of flip open, and does he want me to be in this relationship? I guess not. And, or yes, he does. And we have, we're looking for this kind of magical sign, and we treat it like a magic eight ball. And the Bible says that you and I are the people who rightly handle God's word, who study it, who know it. And we, man, I'm so passionate 
and our team is so passionate, we want you to be people who don't have to come to the porch, you don't have to hear from anybody, there's nothing special about myself or any of our team other than we just look at God's word and try to read what was it saying then? What's it saying now? What's kind of the eternal principle and truth that's inside of here? Because all of the different truths that are contained in God's word have principles and things that are relevant to your life. It is more relevant to every situation on who you should date, how to handle money, the types of relationships and friendships you should have, how you should speak. I mean, it goes in so many different arenas that are relevant to your life, but in order for you to begin to apply it, you've got to read it, and you've got to be a student of it and begin to understand it. So for that to happen, some of you, here's what you need to do. I want you to take out your phone and write down watermark.org forward slash Dallas forward slash ministries, forward slash equipped disciple. Actually, just go to watermark.org, type in equipped disciple, equipped disciple. It's a class that we offer here to help you understand how to know to read your Bible. So you don't just read it and go, what in the world is happening right here? Another opportunity that you can go to is we have Views from the Porch, which is an alternative podcast that we do. It's a podcast that we did specifically, or one of them we did specifically was on how to have quality time with the creator. You can go read about how to have quality time with your creator. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles that are for free in the Dallas location in the Welcome Center right outside of these doors. You can grab one tonight. That's our gift to you for free. Another thing that you could consider doing is getting a good study Bible. We actually have one here that we sell at cost. I think we actually sell below cost. It's an ESV study Bible. It is a tremendous resource. It is better than going to seminary. And I say to somebody going to seminary, who's went to seminary, that if you read through this entire thing, you will be as equipped as you could be if you went to seminary. But either way, finding a good study Bible that just contains like, man, this helps me understand what was going on so I don't have this kind of generic, just rip this, these verses and words out of context and just go, man, I guess that's what God wants me to do with a prostitute. Is she a prostitute? Is that what God is saying? No. You just ripped a random verse out of Ezekiel. And he wants you to know and understand. And so for you to do that, you gotta recognize this word is true and you have to be a student of it and understanding of it. The truth is, many of us don't want to read the Bible because we just don't want to apply it to our life. Like, we kind of like staying ignorant about it. We don't want to know exactly all that is in there, and we don't want to have a bunch of rules, or we even think of the Bible as a bunch of rules that God has given because he's kind of a buzzkill of this, like, cosmic hall monitor. Like, truly, I don't think anyone would say it that way, but you, like, there's part of all of us, and at least myself, I'll say it, that thinks that like God is up there and he's like, hey, look, all right, let, you're gonna have some fun, but too much fun, and I am turning the sun off. We are not doing this right now. <laughs> this is too much, okay? So if you had one too many to drink, then uh, the, uh, I'm done with you. You are in timeout for the next three days. <laughs> or the, if I don't do something right, that he's out there and he's just some cosmic hall monitor and he's given rules. Come on, dude, I, I, there's so many of you, you actually think this, and I want you to think about how illogical it is. You think that God is there just giving rules because he's got nothing better to do. He's like, I'm God. I'm kind of up here alone. I got the angels over there, but I got nothing. All right. Hey, you guys, stop sleeping together. No more fun over there and no tobacco for you, mister. That's what you think God is doing. And the Bible doesn't say that at all. It says he gives the law or he gives instructions and principles from the Bible to lead you to life because he loves you. He cares about you. It's not that he has nothing better to do than be a buzzkill. He cares about you. Any, any dog parents in this room? Okay, great. Uh, think about like the different, uh, when I'll say it this way. When in my last house, there was a time in our home where we didn't have a fence in the backyard. And not having a fence made it to where I couldn't let the dog go out in the backyard because he could just run away different places. He'd get hit by another car. If he escaped, he could do different things. And then we got a fence, a parameter that was put into his life. And he was given more freedom to go out and chase squirrels or do whatever dogs like to do. And in doing so, a parameter led him to more freedom, not less freedom. He wasn't in danger of his life being taken by running into a car. And as any dog parent here, like you love your dog or you care about him like a parent loves children. You care about them and you don't give them rules or you don't give instructions. Or you don't like pull him out of the street or stop him from running in the street because you're there to rip your dog off. You're like, you know, no more fun for you, Mr. Sniffles. <laughs> think about that. That's what you think about God. Like, how ridiculous would it be if somebody was like, you know what, I just think these humans really like holding these dogs back. That's what some people think about God when they go, man, he's just there to kind of give rules. It's a big killjoy. The God who's there gives parameters to enhance, to bring more freedom into your life. 
not less. And whenever we live according to our own, just what seems right to me, oftentimes we end up exchanging our freedom or in the name of freedom, handing over that freedom and we're trapped, we're in bondage. Is an alcoholic who has the freedom to drink as much as he wants free when he can't go three days without having a drink? Is a pornography act. It's total freedom. You can do, it all, do whatever you want. Is he free when he can't go a month without looking at porn? No. God isn't there to give rules to rip you off. And all the parameters that he gives are there to enhance freedom, to keep you free, to keep me free, not to take it away. So the second idea is recognizing God's word is truth. Your perspective may or may not be truth. God's word is truth. And finally, recognize when to share your perspective. Or recognize, culture would say this is recognize when to speak your truth. Because here's what, what is kind of true about that idea. There are times the Bible commands you to speak your perspective or your feelings, what you're thinking, your opinion, your emotions. You know that? In other words, the Bible, like this was crazy to me. There's so many times in, in scripture it says you need to speak these things. You need to say certain things. You need to express with your mouth or articulate and communicate in different ways. Like, if you're gonna follow Jesus, it involves you sharing your perspective on things and recognizing when to share those things and what to share as it relates to my perspective is a part of following Jesus and any maturing taking place inside of your life. So here are some of the times as it relates to the things that you were commanded to speak. They're related to, um, I'll set it up, I guess. Um, who's heard the phrase, always, sometimes, never? Good, two of you, okay. <laughs> For the rest of you, let me educate. There's things that in life you always speak. Sometimes you sometimes speak, you never speak. Um, that is a phrase that comes from, or the always, sometimes, never, comes from uh, really, uh, first thing I've heard about it is it relates to wedding suits. So I don't do a lot of weddings really that much anymore, but recently, because my suit that I've had for like 10 years has gotten too small, and I've ripped it in two back-to-back -back weddings. Had it fixed, ripped it again, and it was like, oh man, I, I need to wave the towel, and I've put on too much weight. So. I got another suit, and as I was sitting there kind of getting fitted for the suit, it was a two-button suit, and they began to explain that there are certain suits that have three buttons, certain suits that have two, and if you have a three-button suit, it, it should look something like this, that a three-button suit, there's sometimes, always, and never. If you have a two-button suit, then it is always and never, always and never. In other words, just like in that scenario, that's what it means, ladies, in case this is just educational for you someday, when a guy wears a suit, the bottom one, not even sure why we have it on there, but it's not supposed to be buttoned ever. The middle one, apparently it's always supposed to be buttoned, and the top one, sometimes. I don't know who makes these rules, but they're out there. And if you have a two-button suit, she began to explain, that is a always and a never, but you never, never, ever button that bottom one. In the same way, the Bible, has certain things that are always speak and never speak. Always speak and never speak. There are certain things that you should always speak, always communicate. What are some of those things as it relates to what you should share? You should always speak, or these are the truth, this is your perspective you should share. You should always speak your hurts. Matthew chapter 18, verses 14 and 15 says this. We call this keeping short accounts. When somebody's hurt you, especially if they're a believer, I go to them and I say, hey, I, that hurt my feelings when you did X and I focus on the specific hurt or the specific action, two things I focus on, the action that they took and the emotion it created inside of me. I don't focus on character, I don't focus on motive, I don't focus on this is just who you are, you're a bad apple, you always do this type of thing. I focus on the specific action, you didn't call me back, and it made me feel like you don't care about me. I focus on the specific action, the specific hurt, or the emotion that it created with me. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 11 says that, hey, if you can overlook it, if you can believe the best and overlook it, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. But if I'm hurt and I, I can't because I keep replaying the tape of what they did, I go to that person and I speak my hurt. What's another thing? You should always speak and confess your sins. James chapter five, verse 16 says, you should have authentic relationships with people in your life where you can confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. But God says the healing process involves you confessing to another human the different areas in your life where you are sinning, that you should have authentic relationships. This is why we harp on small groups and community groups so much, so that if you're a guy, you can have guys around you who are going, hey, look, I looked at pornography this week. I was tempted to look at pornography. I'm, I'm confessing where I'm tempted. 
I just have had lustful thoughts running through my head about a past relationship. That's a conversation that recently took place from me in my community group. There's no perfect pastor up here who has it all together. You need to have authentic relationships and you should always speak and confess at a sin level, at a temptation level, and have people in your life. The third one, share your story. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 talks about how we're to encourage one another and play a role in spurring each other on to loving good deeds. How can I do that if I don't know your story? If I don't know the pain that you felt, the ways people have hurt you, the ways there's like a father wound or somebody walked out and just some of the baggage in your story. You should share your story. If there's sexual abuse, you should share that. You don't need to be ashamed of that. You need to know that 1 Thessalonians chapter four verses one through three says, God is the avenger of such people and people who do such acts. But you don't need to be ashamed of that. And you can bring that out in the light and share with others so that they can better love and care and know you. The fourth one, you should share your feelings. Hebrews chapter three, verses 12 and 13 says that as it relates to like your heart and what you feel, other people are God's provision for helping you kind of navigate the feelings and emotions that you have inside of your heart. And there are the tools that God uses to be those who speak in and are like, man, I know you're angry right now, but what does the Bible say about anger? That you should speak what you're feeling. If you feel sexually oriented towards the same sex, you shouldn't feel like, I can't share that, I'm ashamed of that, I'm embarrassed of that. You should feel the freedom to share that. If you uh, feel like someone whose orientation is off or someone whose gender is off and not aligned with who God made you to be, you should feel the freedom to share that. Then there's things you should never speak. Oh, and then finally, the Fifth always speak thing is Proverbs chapter 27, verse six, that you should speak hard things. You cannot be a good friend without being willing to tell the truth, even when it's hard. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. You cannot be a good friend. And you don't know if you, you don't have good friends if you don't have people who are willing to tell you the hard truth, even when it's uncomfortable. Five things, and I'm wrapping up because they're playing music behind me and it's starting to get, starting to get spiritual in here. Hopefully it's actually been spiritual for a while, but five things you should never speak when it's slander. Colossians chapter three, verse eight. When it's speaking evil about someone, in other words. When it's gossip, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19. When you're talking about someone and they're not present. Inventing is what you call it, and it is sin. You should never speak gossip. When it tears others down, Ephesians chapter four, verse 29. You and I, how crazy would, the, our city would change if this verse got applied. Never say a word about anyone unless it's building them up. Never. When it's out of selfish motives. If you're saying it just to make yourself, number four, look better, you shouldn't. Philippians chapter two, verse three. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Nothing, Paul? Nothing out of selfish ambition. And number five, when it is reckless. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. This is why we harp on community so much. Life is hard. Your 20s and 30s are hard, but they are so much harder when you are alone. And when you don't have a relationship with people that can come around and you can be real with. In summary, recognize your perspective may or may not be truth. God's word is truth. And recognize when to share your perspective. As it relates to the idea of you know, the chicken sandwich, there really isn't like a truth there. That's totally opinion. But as it relates to that Laurel Yanny, there is a truth. And it may not be all the perspectives represented here, but the creator of it said, it, no, it's Laurel. It, it is Laurel. People may hear something different, but I, I created it. I know it. I made it. It was Laurel. It was for a script and for like a playwright that had Laurel in it, I believe. But point being, you can find out what's true by going back to the creator and seeking to understand what is true. You know what one of the marks of those, Paul says in Romans chapter one, who are underneath the wrath of God, we're about to lay in the flame. He says, here's how you can know someone is underneath the wrath of God. They have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator, who is forever praised. Amen. They exchanged the truth and they took on a lie. They didn't realize they were doing it. They didn't, may not have even intentionally did it. 
But Paul says, you know what? When someone is under the wrath of God, it's, they pushed aside the truth of what God's word says. This is how sexuality should exist. This is the purpose in life. This is what life is ultimately all about. I'm pushing that aside, pushing God's word aside. I'm pushing all of that truth aside. And in its place, I'm putting my opinion. Our culture is embodying what Paul said. It looks like to be underneath the wrath of God. By pushing aside the truth and embracing a lie. But here's the good news. All over our country right now, there are young adults who are rising up like many inside of this room, like many inside of those who are listening right here, and they're saying, we're, not gonna, we're gonna live according to what this book says, what it says about where life is found, what it says about sexuality, what it says about marriage, how I should date, how I should live, how I should spend my time. They're rising up and they're saying, I'm not gonna buy the lie of Miley Cyrus and everybody else who I can clearly see live however you want does not work. It doesn't work for them. It's never worked for anyone. And I'm going to surrender my life. And I'm not going to do it perfectly, but I'm going to do it purposefully. And I'm going to try to apply what God says in here and take it and apply it to my life. And I'm going to live that way. And many in this room are doing it. Many in different campuses right now. Here's what you need to know. In Austin, Texas, in El Paso, Texas, Tulsa, Sweetwater, Texas, El Paso, mention it again, Houston, Nashville, Philadelphia, Cedar Rapids, Mint Hill, North Carolina, Fayetteville, Woodland Spring, Phoenix, Cincinnati and other locations, young adults by the thousands right now are listening in at various Ports Live locations and their people coming together saying, we're going to live according to what this book says. We're gonna follow God. God is, uh, my heart will not be my God. I'm gonna let God be the Lord of my heart and I'm gonna surrender and walk with him and it is gonna change our country. This is a generation that will redefine the church. It's gonna redefine the church for a hundred generations. I believe that with all of my heart by realigning with what God's word says, by men and women saying, I'm not gonna, I'm, nobody comes with me. I'm not gonna date like Taylor Swift tells me to date. I'm not gonna live like, like all of celebrity culture and Hollywood tells me, like, this is where life is found. Shortly before they overdose, because tragically they haven't found still what they're looking for. But everywhere, and not just at these different locations, there's men and women in this generation all over the country saying, I'm gonna follow Jesus and I'm gonna live according to what he says and they're experiencing life and the same God who's there offers that extension and invitation to you if you will live according to his word. That's not how you have eternal life. Jesus said in John chapter 14, let me close here. He said a, a really remarkable thing. They're sitting around, it's one of his last conversations with his boys and he begins to talk about heaven and he says this in John chapter 14 verse six. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, truth is not something you define. Truth is not something that changes. Truth is a person. Truth has a name, and it is Jesus, and it is in knowing him and, and walking with him. All of life begins to make sense, Everything dysfunctional, it doesn't overnight just snap in perfectly, but everything in this world begins to like click and I begin to see it more clearly. But Jesus says, he puts purpose in all of life in focus because truth and all of the word and scriptures and the things in God's word were meant to point to God's son who John chapter one says is the ultimate word of God. And in walking with him and in living according to his word, there is life or you can exchange the truth of God for a lie. And when you do, Paul says the same thing happens every time. You experience distance from your creator and destruction in your life. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you have reached into so many of our hearts in this room, into those listening, and you have allowed us to see the truth of God in the face of Jesus. Thank you that you have not left us without instruction, but you have given us, through your word, principles, teachings, things meant to lead us to life, to help us navigate what it looks like to date, to live, to work, to have healthy relationships, to not feel alone, to not be alone. Thank you that you love us. I pray for anyone in this room who has not experienced 
encountering the truth of Jesus. There's nothing that I could do, no message that I could give, no music that we could play that could allow someone to see the reality and the truth of Jesus. He alone is the way to heaven exclusively. He is the alone, he alone is the way to life, and he alone, just like truth, is exclusive. Is the God who was there, who came and put on human flesh to die in our place, and he calls us to truth, and in his word we find truth. Would you help any of our friends who've never experienced and trusted tonight, whether they're in this room or in the 20 different locations listening? Tonight is their night, God. Would you whisper and do what only you can do, which is stretch out your hand and say, we love you and we worship you now in song and we believe and we see a generation rising up. It will change the church and call it back to realigning with what the church was always intended to be, the people of God living by the word of God, walking with the son of God. We worship you now in song, amen.